Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. Watch ye stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. That was a really lengthy reading, Tanner. Thank you. As most of you know, Tanner's in graduate school in Akron, and it's always nice to have him back home. Judy Jones uh, sprained her ankle, twisted it, and uh, having trouble walking on it, so she's not with us this morning. And Agata is under the weather and unable to be out this morning as well. There may be others, but those are the only two that I'm aware of that didn't make the announcement sheet, and I just became aware of those uh, before we started. Again, if you're visiting with us, we're really glad to have you here. I hope you filled out one of the attendance cards and put it in the basket uh, when it was passed, but if you didn't do that, let me encourage you again to fill it out and hand it to to someone in the back of the auditorium as you leave this morning and they'll see that it gets to the office. we just like to know those who are visiting and it helps me to see your name in writing uh, to remember. So please do that. Uh, We have several visitors today and we hope that you will want to be with us anytime you're in our area. As Kurt said in Uh, the beginning of our assembly this morning, it is our desire to be guided by the scriptures in all things. And should you have any questions at all, uh, do not hesitate to ask them. We will do our very best to give Bible questions, Bible answers. And I'm sure that's precisely what you would want. I do know that we have uh, two sets of new grandparents uh, with us this morning. I hope you saw the announcements uh, on the board between our Bible study and worship. Kurt's going to say more about that. I can't remember the names, how long they were, how much they weighed, so I'll leave that to uh, someone better equipped to deal with it. But congratulations to the parents and grandparents. And also, a note of uh, change in programming, next Sunday, the 30th, our 9 o'clock, 8.30 and 9 o'clock radio programs will air as scheduled, but the 11 o'clock program on WMOA will be moved to 3.30. It has something to do with football in England, and I don't understand it all, but I told them to do whatever they needed to do, and we would be fine with it. So... Next Sunday afternoon, uh, if you listen to Words for Living, it will be on WMOA at 3.30. It's usually at 11, and I never hear it, so I wouldn't have known if they hadn't actually contacted me. Guidelines are important. Rules and regulations are essential. There are just certain things that need to be done in certain ways, and we understand that. When you fly, do you know that the pilot and co-pilot have a checklist, and they go down through that list every time? I'm glad they do, because they might miss something really important if they didn't. In fact, there has been an effort afoot in recent years to do the same thing in the surgery room where a checklist is followed. That way you don't leave sponges inside the victim. We call them the patient, but if you've got a sponge inside, I think you're a victim. Checklists can be good things. Guidelines can be important. Do you know who Hitler called the most dangerous woman in England? Was she a spy or maybe a scientist who 
was developing a weapon that would end the war immediately. When Hitler's bombers pummeled England, they hit Buckingham Palace. The next day, as you all know, reporters toured the scene. And uh, they echoed what many others, I suspect, were thinking. Shouldn't the princesses be taken to safety out in the country? Get them away. But the most dangerous woman in England, the Queen Mother, responded in this way. The children will not leave unless I do, she began. And I will not leave unless the king does, their father, she added. And the father, the king, will not leave the country in any circumstance whatsoever. I thought, what a marvelous example to set. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have leaders like that again? who have courage and conviction and put the welfare of the nation ahead of themselves and their family as this noble woman did. She played the part of the queen in such a wonderful way. Set an example that Hitler and all of his bombs could not possibly defeat. Well, if you were listening carefully to the text that Tanner read, and I know, again, it was very brief, that text really offers marching orders for the saints. As Paul closed his letter to the church at Corinth, he did so with words of encouragement, words of warning that resonated then and still ought to resonate with true people of God. There are five imperatives in these two brief verses. Four of them have military overtones, and so we'll essentially say they are orders from the commander-in-chief conveyed through one of his lieutenants, the Apostle Paul. And they're such simple and yet such profound things. Be watchful. Stand fast in the faith. Act like men. Do you? Just that one statement, act like men, just resonates with authority and power and importance. And let all things be done in love. I want to simply look at these five great imperatives this morning in a way that will help us as we lead to be what God calls us to be as his children. Watch ye. Be on alert. The New American Standard Bible says, be on your guard as a sentinel. Be ever on the alert. Which reminds me, by the way, of Ezekiel chapter 3 and again in chapter 33. In Ezekiel's day, cities for protection were walled. The walls were often quite tall and very broad. And sentinels were placed at appropriate spacing throughout the entire circumference of the city on the walls. Their sole job was to survey the horizon and to watch for the approach of the enemy. When the enemy was spotted, it was the responsibility of the sentinel, the watchman, to sound the warning. It was, in, I suspect, most ways, a very boring job. But one that was exceedingly important. If the enemy approaches and the watchman fails in his duty, the city may be destroyed and the blood of all of its residents will be on the head of the watchman. But, Ezekiel says in both texts, if the watchman sounds the warning and the warning is not heeded, the city may well fall, but it will not be the watchman's duty or responsibility, pardon me. That will fall on others who fail to take action. 
in a sense, are we not all watchmen for God today on the wall, standing as sentinels, gazing at the horizon, ready to sound the warning at a moment's notice? What are we watching for, by the way? We're watching, guarding our own minds. Keep your heart with all diligence, Solomon wrote, for out of it are the issues of, of life. And in Philippians chapter 4, there again, Paul writes about some great imperatives for Christians, and among them, verse 8, think on these things. We are sentinels. We are called to be watchmen. And we begin by watching our own minds, thinking on the things that are pure and lovely and just and of good report, and avoiding those things that will contaminate, will lead us away from God and closer to the devil. And if we fail to be the proper watchman, there is no doubt we will fall into one of the devil's traps. Be careful what goes into your mind because it will determine what comes out in your life. Watch your associations. I don't know that we say enough these days about the importance of selecting our friends carefully. I know often I hear young people defend associations with those of questionable character with the argument, well, I'm going to help them. I'm going to bring them up and teach them the gospel, draw them closer to God. Commendable as that is, it generally doesn't happen. Rather, we get sucked in and pulled away and pulled down. The warning of 1 Corinthians 15.33 is very clear. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. Does that mean we cut off all ties with anyone who doesn't agree with us on the basic matters of morality today? Of course not. What it means very simply is that we watch our associates, our associations, so that we bring around us or surround ourselves with those who share our common faith, our common commitment, our common goal of heaven with God. We don't cut off our contact with others, but our closest and dearest friends if we're keeping our guard up, will be those that share our philosophy for life, our love for God, our desire to be saints. Watch our relationships as well. And in this regard, I mean for opportunities to help people. Please understand that your Christianity doesn't end when the last amen has been said and you walk out the door. In a way, it really is just beginning because we are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. It is through us that God works. Our hands are his hands, our feet are his feet, and our mouths are his mouths to be used to his glory and honor. And every time we find an opportunity to serve and serve, we're guarding our relationships and building on a foundation of faith that says to those around us that God matters in our life. We walk the talk. We know that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, as well as keeping oneself unspotted from the world. We know that ultimately we will be judged on the basis of whether we fed the hungry, clothed the naked, visited the sick, that is, ministered to them. And all of those kinds of things, Matthew 25, 31 through 46. You may recall the exchange between Jesus and the Pharisee regarding the greatest commandment. Of course, you know Jesus said it is to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. But then he went on to say, and the second is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Leviticus 19, 18. Folks, when we walk out of this building, we have to determine that we will practice what we preach. 
we will be on our guard to see opportunities to serve and to encourage. People often just need an encouraging word. And we ought to be the ones that are speaking it. And we have a real duty to watch against the enemy. To be on our guard against those who would attack our faith, destroy it and take us down the road to ruin that they travel. In my judgment, we've done a better job with the previous three than with this fourth. It has become so common in the religious world to compromise that the attitude of compromise is even infiltrating the church. And we've got to keep our guard up. We don't carry a rifle. But we do carry the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And with it, we can vanquish all the enemies that Satan can bring against us. But we've got to know how to use the weapon that is available. And therefore, we must be very careful students of the Word and committed to do what God demands in it. We don't have any earthly sergeant giving us orders today, but the captain of our salvation, Hebrews 2.10, is in charge. Are we taking our orders from him? And ladies and gentlemen, he does not tell us that the duty will be light, just the opposite. And thus we're charged to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. If you're looking for an easy way, it is not the way of Christ. His way is demanding. It is sacrificial, it is generous, it is faithful. And we must be willing to walk in that way. Keep your guard up, ladies and gentlemen, when you leave this place today, throughout the week, that you might maintain your relationship with the Lord and be an instrument in His, in, in his hands to do good. I should not have stayed up late to watch that silly football, Tim because I feel the effects of it and you're hearing them this morning. I would simply not allow football to be played after eight if it were up to me. But then again, last night it wasn't really played, at least not by the Buckeyes. But I digress. The Mountaineers did well. Stand fast in the faith when under attack. Be strong, steadfast. Do not yield an inch. Is that how you feel? There are some things that, in my mind, don't matter. Margie and I had a conversation about that just walking down the sidewalk this morning. I don't get upset when my team doesn't play like I think they ought to play. I don't really have a team, to be honest with you. But in the great scheme of things, it doesn't matter. I don't care if the Cubbies or the Indians win the series. My grandson does, but I don't. In the great scheme of things, it doesn't matter. Does that mean you can't have your favorite team and root them? Well, of course not. I'm just saying to you that in the great scheme of things, let's make sure that we focus on the matters that matter most and stand fast. I don't care if you follow a different team if you drive a different kind of automobile, if you have a favorite soft drink that isn't Dr. Pepper, that's okay. But when it comes to Christ and his church, folks, plant your feet and don't budge an inch. Be set for the defense of the gospel, Philippians 1, 17. Steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Run the race, finish it, fight the good fight, and then lay hold of the crown, the victor's crown. You can only do that when you stand firm or fast in the faith. We cannot compromise where God has spoken. We can compromise on a lot of things. We can compromise on the appropriate time to meet on the Lord's Day. 
We can compromise on how many songs we're going to sing, but not that we're going to sing. We can compromise on how many prayers we're going to pray publicly. None of that is dictated. But our coming together on the Lord's Day around the Lord's table to observe the Lord's Supper is something we cannot compromise on. The nature of our worship and what we do, that's not given to compromise. What a person has to do to be saved, that's not a matter of compromise. Our world has compromised. They've tried to make it as easy as they can make it. But they've rejected God's way. And we can't compromise relative to marriage and morality and a whole host of issues that fall under that heading just because the world has. We who are Christians will continue to stand fast for the sanctity of life in a world that no longer values babies in their mother's womb or parents when they get old. But that won't be true of Christians who are steadfast, who stand fast in the Lord. Too, too many have already surrendered to the enemy. Don't be among the number. Quit ye like men. That's the King James translation. Quit you like men is the New American Standard Bible. Be a person, a man or woman of courage, the Queen Mother. They won't leave unless I leave. And I won't leave unless the king leaves and the king ain't leaving. That's how I feel about the church. You can say whatever you want to say about me. You can throw tomatoes or stones or do whatever. I will be loyal to my Lord. My soul is at stake. He died to redeem me. I have to be courageous as all Christians do. Play the part of the hero in a spiritual sense. There are going to be all kinds of opportunities before us to do just that. We'll be in settings where we'll hear something advocated that we know is contrary to this wonderful book. Play the hero and stand up for Christ and speak out for truth. You're going to hear all kinds of arguments made in defense of the indefensible. Stand for truth. We do not have to give in to this political correct world we find ourselves in today. And we must not compromise his glorious truth. Oh, how desperately he calls out for us to be men and women of courage and conviction walk out of this building this morning determined to be a man for God that's not even a politically correct statement anymore now you understand the meaning I'm not talking about gender I'm talking about courage be courageous we have nothing to fear if we're men and women of God so let's act on our courage Arm yourself for the battle. And Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 16, urges us to do just that. To be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong. Like a well-equipped and well-trained soldier Be strong to fight for your king. And it's a fight. The church ought to be militant, engaged in battle. Not a physical, earthly, carnal battle. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty. Islam is a religion of carnal weapons and carnal warfare. Christianity is not. And yet, we are soldiers We have enlisted in the army of the Lord. We ought to make sure that we're prepared to fight the fight and ultimately to lay hold on eternal life. That's why in chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Four great imperatives 
with military means. But the fifth, the metaphor suddenly changes. And this is what Paul wrote. Let all things be done in love. Whatever a Christian soldier is to those who threaten the Christian faith, then folks, we ought to stand tall when under attack. Whatever we are when under attack from outsiders, to those within the body, we must be comrades and friends. We must love one another with a pure heart fervently. Brotherly love must abound. We are to love each other as we love God and demonstrate that to the world. When asked, how do you distinguish the Lord's church from all the counterfeits? Or how do you tell a Christian from an imposter? The answer is John 13, 35, from the lips of Christ himself. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. I tell you, if I know my heart, I never say anything from this pulpit or in any classroom or private setting designed to inflict pain or intentional discomfort. I say hard things because this book is filled with hard, demanding, difficult things. But I say them out of love because they are given in love. And they're designed to make us better. We are a family. Remember that setting when the, the room was packed? It was a Trump convention. They couldn't get in there. It was so full. And Jesus and his mother's were, mother, was, they were on the outside. And somebody came to him and said, Your mother and your brothers are out and can't get in. What did he say? Who are my mother and brothers? All of you. Who's our family in Christ? Look around you. Here are our brothers and sisters. And our elder brother Jesus is now at the right hand of the Father. And because we're part of the family, we can pray, Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And we can depend on each other. We can count on each other. Because we love as Christians ought to love. This brotherly love that is dictated in scripture is demonstrated in reality when God's people are everything God's people ought to be. So in conclusion, in the Christian life there must be courage which will never retreat and love which will never fail. I'd like to say that's original of me but I read it in one of Barclay's daily Bible study series, page 186. And I forget which one, that's why I didn't note it. Be watchful as you lead. Stand firm in your faith. Let nothing and no one tear you away from Christ and his church. Act like a man. You know what that means. Be strong. We have no reason to cower before any enemy. Remember in the Old Testament what God told Israel over and over and over again. One of you shall defeat ten. Ten of you a hundred. A hundred of you a thousand. Jonathan the son of Saul said it as well as it can be said in 1 Samuel 14.6. He turned to his armor bearer as they faced the Philistines and said to the man who carried his armor, I am persuaded, I am confident, in essence I am certain that there's no restraint with the Lord to say by many or by few. Let us arise, you and me, and go into the garrison of the Philistines. And he did just that and defeated them. That's the confidence we bring to every day. We do it 
because we love God and because we love others and more than anything else we want to go to heaven and we want others to go as well you know God's Word is not that difficult folks to understand it's the application that gives us the trouble not because often that's hard it's because not doing it is just a whole lot easier the cost of failing is our own soul the result of faithfulness is life with God as I said we will not compromise when it comes to truth so we close with an invitation to those who are not Christians to know what we know as children of God, but to understand that in order to be one of His, we have to obey His will, and that means we come to faith in Him and in His Son that leads us to repentance, confession, and immersion. A watery grave with a resurrection to new life, cleansed not by the water, but by the blood, whereupon the Lord will add us to His church, and if we stand fast, stay faithful, be strong and courageous and love as we should. We'll be a powerful force for good in this world and be with the Lord eternally. Isn't that what life really ought to be about? Is it true in your case? And if not, are you ready to make it true? I know there are folks right here this morning who need to obey Jesus, but you keep delaying. Stop delaying and come to Christ right now.